Hello, I'm Dr. James Shapiro, Professor of Surgery Medicine and Surgical Oncology at the University of Alberta and Canada Research Chair. I'm delighted to provide this video update that accompanies our chapter on islet cell transplantation, a future therapy for type 1 diabetes. Now these are islets that are infused into, pati into patients. Uh, they vary in size between 50 and 150 microns. Uh, they are derived from human uh, organ donors, the same organ donors that provide heart, lungs and livers for transplantation, and they're stained here with a dye called uh, dithazone that stains the zinc. Now this is a video provided to me kindly by Dr. Camilla Ricordi in uh, Miami, and you can see here that here's a, a human pancreas that is being digested. Uh, it's first cannulated uh, to deliver collagenase into the uh, pancreatic duct system, and after cannulation of the pancreas, uh, we distend the enzyme throughout the gland, and then chop it up into pieces and then place the pancreas into what's called the Ricordi uh, chamber. Camilla uh, developed this in the late 1980s and it's uh, become the standard way, uh, the only way in fact, to, to isolate large numbers of human islets uh, for transplantation. Here the pancreas is being perfused and then it's later placed into a, a chamber. Here, now let's move on to the chamber and then the, the chamber here is uh, shown. So the transplant part, once we have uh, our islets, is very straightforward. So we inject a local anesthetic in the side, and the islets are infused in the liver into the portal vein that runs up into the liver. And here's a portal angiogram where you can see the catheter sitting in the main portal vein and simply dripping the cells in through here while measuring the pressure and then occluding the track at the end makes this a very safe uh, transplant. We've called it here the safest transplant by far if it's done in the right way and the tract is, ad is adequately ablated at the end of the procedure. Now, with the islet transplant activity now, there's been a large number of transplants performed. There are 30 or so active sites internationally, you know, perhaps a, a drop in activity in the last uh, few years uh, because many of the sites are depending, dependent upon research funding. But you can see in the University of Alberta where we carried out 66 islet transplants uh, last year and uh, we have patients now followed up for over 14 years. And in fact, two of the first patients are still completely free of insulin uh, about 14 and a half years now after their uh, transplants. We found early on that it, we lost some function of the islets uh, at about uh, three to four years. Most patients needed to go back on insulin. So we've been working on plugging the holes uh, uh, since to improve uh, uh, function by removing uh, factors that lead to early damage of islets, such as the donor injury, processing injury, hypoxia, apoptosis, inflammation. And we've been working also, too, on uh, minimizing late graft loss by uh, controlling acute and chronic rejection autoimmunity and metabolic stress and we've been using alemtuzumab induction in our patients to uh, facilitate this process and now very standard immunosuppression with tacrolimus and Celsept. We know that many of the islets uh, that we transplant uh, are inadequate and uh, are, um, require further optimization. Now there are at least six centers in the world that have uh, over uh, half their patients uh, insulin free at about five years including uh, centers in Minnesota ourselves in Edmonton where 58% uh, of patients now remain insulin free at seven years and several other sites as well including San Francisco, uh, University of Illinois, Lidl and uh, Geneva uh, Gradual Network. And uh, these results are improving all the time. So this ch chapter will discuss uh, in detail uh, the outcomes and the future opportunities for improving islet cell transplantation to make it more available for patients with type 1 diabetes. I hope you enjoy reading it. Thank you.